on Father's Day, June 18. Uh, we have the Wooden Boat Show, and then we're also going to have uh, a yard sale of uh, some interesting uh, objects having to do with uh, the maritime. So it's going to be uh, something to aim for. That's Father's Day. Also, on August 19th, prepare yourself for the famous Chowder Fest, and that's from 2 to 6. Somebody even asked me about it already today. And uh, uh, we'd like to uh, welcome all members and non-members. We have a lot of new members here. And uh, also, anyone who is not a member, uh, you know, it's free if you get a membership to come to the speaker series. And, uh, you know, you'd be very welcome. Now to get on to business of the evening, uh, having to do with uh, the gentleman you just saw. Glenn Henning. Uh, we're welcoming Glenn back. He's been active with this museum. Uh, in fact, he uh, helped organize a, uh, an exhibit last year uh, with the ancient maritime cultures of Peru. That's one of his areas of specialty. Yeah, but here are some things you don't know about him. And I didn't know about this organization. He's the co-founder of Groundswell Society. And that's a surfing organization that for 20 years has organized fundraising surfing events. Uh, and one of them that he uh, organized was even at um, Scripps Institute of Oceanography. Uh, Glenn is the founder of Surfrider Foundation, and I'm sure most of you have heard of that. Uh, it is a, a nonprofit environmental organization, and uh, Glenn has three teaching certificates. He taught for 25 years, uh, recently uh, left that to be an entrepreneur. He has uh, invented a uh, exercise machine that has a patent pending, so we'll probably hear more about that in the future. He lives near here in Oxnard Shores uh, with his, as he, and he says this, his wonderful wife Heidi and their trusty dog Otis. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Glenn uh, understanding and feeling for the energy of waves and the world's oceans is why he is here tonight. And so he is going to tell us about those mad seas of the great southern ocean, uh, which he researched for his epic novel, Waves of Warning. So here is Glenn Henning. here at the museum and thank you all for being here tonight I was saying to Heidi who's going to be interested in stories about you know the other side of the world who's really going to want to you know uh, listen to what I have to say about um, a, an era of sale that is you know long gone but you're all here so thank you very much and I appreciate that um, as Arlene mentioned I do have uh, uh, 25 years of teaching experience so uh, the test on Friday will be open notes, don't worry about that. And uh, I want to thank uh, my wife Heidi for being here. She does have some copies of my novel, Waves of Warning, uh, that was written basically for surfers, but I also rewrote the story um, in terms of the Polynesian Islanders and the Wayfarer Society called Ka'unua, Sacred Reef, Reef of the Sea People. So we have uh, some copies over there. Uh, if all of this intrigues you, which I certainly hope it will. That isn't a pitch for the book, but they are 25 bucks. <laughs> Heidi has changed. <laughs> okay, in any event, um, I kind of feel like Roy Rogers. I always, when I was young, I always wanted like the Fanner 50s, the dual Fanner 50s. So I have two <laughs> units here. I have one that's going to change the screen and or change the image, and then I've got the other one that's a pointer because it's a nice bright pointer. Uh, so what I want to do is get started by thanking my <laughs> wife, thanking my son. Uh, there's some very familiar faces out here. Pat Morosky, an old colleague of mine teaching school. Uh, David Renson, a colleague of mine in the world of letters. Um, Larry and Shirley, my neighbors from Oxnard Shores. Ron taking the footage. And of course, thanks to Arlene and Pat and everybody here at the museum for making this possible. 
Now what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to take you someplace that you probably, I don't think it's any, anybody here ever been south of uh, 40 degrees south latitude? Okay. Oh, right, so you're going to be keeping me honest through this whole thing. But basically, here we are, and um, there's Los Angeles. Oh, look, they got Oxnard on here. All right, one more, represent. Okay, but we're going to go all the way down here. We're going to talk about the grand expanses of ocean that literally run around the planet unimpeded. And the great southern ocean is a place that not a lot of people have been to, but the people who have been there usually come back completely changed. In fact, a, a group of racers uh, who were racing the Volvo World Ocean Race, when they finally got back to port after uh, c completing the race, about three of them went into a rehab facility to have total peace and quiet for about a month. <laughs> because what they had just gone through had been such an incredible ordeal that they needed time to just gather themselves all over again. Okay, so here we go. Um, the most mad seas. That's, a, that's a, a phrase that came from Sir Francis Drake. And when Sir Francis Drake went around Cape Horn, he was, he'd never seen anything like it. And coming out of the North Pacific, that's saying a lot. Um, indeed, the most mad seas. We rarely see these kinds of uh, seas. And remember, the sailors would call them seas. They weren't waves, they were seas. And when you take a look at something that's as, you know, that looks like this, you go, wow, that's a lot of energy. Well, it's going to be there. You're going to see it in another five minutes. You're going to see it another half hour. You're going to see it later today. You're going to see it you know, before the sun goes down. You're going to see it tomorrow. You're going to see it the next day. You might see stuff like this for weeks at a time if you were on a sailing ship during the golden age of sail. Um, and I can tell you that as a surfer, when I see this stuff, it kind of turns my stomach a little bit. Okay? It's an, and in fact, um, tonight's presentation will be in two parts. Uh, first part is going to be the presentation that I'll be giving using PowerPoint. And then um, I was fortunate enough to get a copy of a DVD um, called Rounding Cape Horn, and it was shot in 1929, and it's all black and white, but it's a fascinating film. It's about 39 minutes long, and I got it from the Mystic Seaport uh, Museum back east, thanks to their director, Glenn Gordonier. So, and as, when I was watching it at home, the opening sequences, I get very seasick. I'm susceptible to motion sickness. And when I started watching this, I started twinging a little bit. Like, oh my goodness gracious. And so, uh, in any event, here we go. Um, the, research, the, the presentation you're going to see is based on research I did for my book, Waves of Warning, where I basically posited a situation where I was going to compare surfers <coughs> to real mariners to see what kind of character they had in the face of traditions that go back um, about 600 years. Um, then I, I also wrote a version, um, and I renamed it Kaunua, Sacred Reef of the Sea People, which is less about surfing and more about the ocean's timeless power. And all of the, the, everything you're going to see was done in the name of research for my novels. Okay, so, I also did a, a presentation at the Scripps Institute, uh, Institution of Oceanography uh, as part of our uh, Groundswell Society Surfing Arts, Science, and Issues conferences. And uh, this was Surfers in the Southern Ocean. And so some of these images are going to be part of tonight's presentation. So let's start at Surf's Up. Okay, here's Malibu. Uh, Gidget is walking right up the beach there. Uh, Mickey Dora is right behind her, uh, trying to rent his surfboard at the same time he's trying to sell it to somebody else. And David Rinson, I guess that will, uh, David Rinson here in the audience, he wrote the definitive. <laughs> Um, uh, biography of Mickey Dora, and this was Mickey Dora's home break. The only thing that's interesting about this is that these waves coming into Malibu started almost 8,000 miles away. They started in the Southern Ocean, and once again, in the, um, those waves, they were breaking here, but they started all the way down here. And huge storms that were rolling all the way around Antarctica would send waves up all the way across the Pacific 
and the cry of surf, surfs up would ring out across the beaches of Southern California based on the largest and most powerful energy systems on the other side of the planet. So there's a direct connection between Southern California's surf culture and the Great Southern Ocean. Um, all these guys, yeah, surfers, you know, every one of them is the captain of their own little ship. Um, but little do they know that where these waves came from is probably a place that none of them would ever want to go to. Um, or as an old salt once said to a young sailor, a young sailor was getting on one of the tall ships and he was real excited, he was going to sea, he'd heard all about, you know, the, the great age of sail and being out at sea and uh, he spied an old salt and uh, introduced himself and the conversation went on a little bit and then the young uh, greenhorn said, uh, well, um, sir, do you think we'll see the, uh, the graybeards? And the graybeards was the name for the huge waves that roll around the world in the southern ocean and where the top of the wave is constantly breaking and these huge walls of foam are spilling down the face over and over again, basically from San Francisco to New York. I mean, there are storm systems down there that are as big as the entire United States. And so the old salt looks this young man in the eye and says, so you want to see the graybeards, huh? And the young man says, yes, do you think we're going to see them? And the old salt says, son, you don't want to see them. But well, we're going to get as close as we can take you uh, in this presentation, and I hope it gives you a feel for what the uh, old salt was talking about. Okay, so as we go into the southern hemisphere, we're seeing lots of waves. Now we're left Malibu, now we're here in Australia, and once again, these waves are coming from the storm systems of the Great Southern Ocean. So is this wave. Um, this wave is even a little bit closer to the Roaring Forties. This is a wave in Tahiti. Uh, it's one of the most powerful waves in the world. Um, it's not as powerful as the waves in the, my story, but it comes pretty close. Okay. So you're talking about massive ocean energy that is radiating out around the world. It goes up into Indonesia, it powers all the surf spots in Australia, it powers all the surf spots in uh, Polynesia, and indeed all the surfing areas in Peru and Central America and Mexico and Southern California. The waves from all over those places all come from the same storm systems that are tracking around Antarctica through the Southern Ocean. Of course, the only real surfer when we're, we're talking about these waves is the wandering albatross. Uh, the wandering albatross can sometimes have a wingspan of up to 15 feet. Uh, it has been known to fly um, unimpeded for two weeks at a time. They'll stay on the wing for two weeks at a time, and there's some very interesting tracking information that they've done about just how amazing the, uh, 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 the wandering albatross uh, is when it comes to riding the updraft coming across swells. Okay. Um, you may have seen pelicans gliding up and down the beach here at Oxnard Shores. I know I've seen many of them, especially when it's flat, the pelicans are getting the good waves. Well, imagine a bird that will fly from here to New York and back and never touch the water. And it'll be foraging, it'll find fish, and it'll be eating, and then it will be uh, holding uh, regurgitated protein in its stomach. It'll go back and feed its young, and we'll talk about where they nest uh, in an upcoming slide. <laughs> okay, so back to the Great Southern Ocean. At the center of the so Southern Ocean is Antarctica. And coming down off of Antarctica, you have winds that are called catabatic winds. And those winds actually power up into the storms and actually accelerate storms that are constantly rotating around Antarctica. Uh, there's Australia right there. Um, here's uh, South Africa. And here is the infamous Cape Horn, which we'll get to later in our presentation. Now, why does all this work the way it does? Well. You have, here we are up here in Southern California, and you have winds that blow from west to east, uh, and of course we have storms that come in, and they hit us, and we get big waves, and Hawaii gets waves, and then there's waves here, and they go and they hit Europe, and there's big surf in Europe. But if you look down here, you can see that those waves stop by this continent, those waves get stopped by that continent. Down here, nothing stops them. Nothing stops these storms. They just keep going. Um, they, in fact, uh, going back here, the storms just keep going around and around and around. Nothing ever stops them. And that allows for a natural 
uh, um, environment that is truly phenomenal. And there's only one place in the world where it does this, and it's in the Southern Ocean. Okay, so you've probably all seen this picture. And um, this picture indeed shows three of those storms rotating around Antarctica. And it also shows the southern tip of Africa. And um, we're going to start our little voyage right here on the southern tip of Africa uh, at Cape of Good Hope, which was originally called the Cape of Storms. Uh, this is one of the very first maps that showed coming around. Um, this would be the southern tip of South America. Uh, and the idea is that uh, Vasco da Gama uh, actually was the first person to come around. As you can see, this map is pretty sketchy. It's got rivers that don't exist. And, it's got islands that don't exist. But once again, we've been visiting the Southern Ocean now since the Gama, which would be 1500, about 600 years ago. Okay. Um, once again, here it is a, an image. And this is one of the chief uh, main nesting grounds of the wandering albatross. And indeed, these tracks represent um, uh, uh, foraging tracks that have been uh, identified by putting little tracking units, little GPS units on the back of the birds, and they fly around and, uh, but imagine where they are, okay? It's cold, it's really cold, and there's storms that are constantly doing this, going all the way around Antarctica, but that's where these birds live, and for surfers to see how they ride waves, it only makes us dream about what really riding waves could be. In fact, in my novel, I actually created a group of guys who were able to design a craft that could ride waves almost the way an albatross was. Okay, and so coming around Africa, this is where something really interesting happens because these swells are coming this way, but there's a current coming down the east coast of Africa called the Agulhas Current. And the swells come this way, the current comes that way, and it makes the waves extremely steep. Okay, um, in fact, this particular article um, was uh, talking about huge waves in the Agulhas Current. Um, this picture is not apocryphal. Uh, the waves become so steep that large sailing ships actually don't fit in between the waves. And the waves can be, I think maybe we can kind of take a look out the window. Um, if you can see, if you can see those palm trees over there. Okay, imagine waves the size, the height of those palm trees. And between, that's a wave where those palm trees are, okay? And that wave comes. And then 20 seconds later, another wave that big is coming. And 20 seconds later, another wave. And that's just the standard swell in the Southern Ocean. When those swells bunch up against this current, now you've got a wave that big every 10 seconds, every 15 seconds. It compresses them like an accordion. And it's an extremely dangerous place, even to this day. Um, of course, if you're on an oil tanker, well, you've got gasoline to deliver from the Persian Gulf. And all, in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if some of us tonight driving over here had some gasoline in our tank that in, was originally derived from oil that came from a tanker that came around, uh, that came around the Abdullah's current. Because there is going to be the Persian Gulf, and those tankers come around here, and then they go to Houston, or they go through the Panama Canal. And so, in the Agulhas current, those tankers have to face this kind of stuff. And um, it's, it's serious business, to be sure. How serious? Um, this is a, uh, a ship uh, that was, it's an ocean research vessel that was uh, putting out from um, Port Elizabeth in South Africa. In fact, you may have remembered probably about six, eight years ago, there was a cruise ship that went out. Uh, of um, uh, Port Elizabeth in South Africa and got in trouble in some massive waves. So in, right away, you're thinking, well, what else is there in the Southern Ocean? Because it's a radical place, and the power there can do stuff like that. Okay? So we just left this area right here. Okay? And now we're going to go around, and we're going to go to, um, once again, this is the circum polar west wind drift. The wind is constantly blowing this way, and the storms are constantly going that way. The first person to really explore the Southern Ocean in any detail was Captain Cook. Um, I have a model of Captain Cook's ship, uh, the Endeavor, on my mantle at home. My wife wouldn't let me bring it. <laughs> but if you could see what 
and, and, and of course, uh, Ed Marple's uh, version of the Endeavor is downstairs. It's a, fa a fantastic ship. I, mine, mine's a hatchet job compared to his. Of course, he was a former dentist, so he could get everything just perfect. But if you take a look at what Captain Cook did and where he went, okay, off the tip of South Africa, and he went, he did, he was all the way down through here in a sailing ship, a sailing ship that was made with a very shallow draft, very round bottom, because it was made for carrying coals from Newcastle around to London, and it was a collier. And so what Captain Cook did, going through the Southern Ocean, is one of the greatest feats of seamanship in all of human history. Um, here he is from the Pacific. Just, I mean, it's just astounding that he did this. Um, you just can't even imagine what he was capable of and going, trying to find Antarctica, trying to get down through here. Nobody had ever been there before. He was the first guy to go there. And to see what he saw and to persevere and to continue on and actually make three separate voyages was just an amazing thing. When I was in London many years ago, I made it a point to go see his statue in Hyde Park and have my photograph taken next to it. You know, a surfer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, there's other people who do go through the Southern Ocean. Um, there are several World Ocean races, the Volvo World Ocean Race, the yeah. Vendee um, uh, Ocean Race. Uh, they are round-the-world races, and the only way you can get around the world is to actually sail through the Southern Ocean around uh, Cape of Good Hope, the southern tip of Africa, and, of course, around Cape Horn. So these guys are going through there. And, of course, there's still the odd uh, freighter. Now, it, you can basically imagine what this is like when you have a falling <coughs> wind and you're going with the wind, um, or maybe we're going against the wind. I don't know if this is the stir. I guess this must be the bows. So we're going with the wind. But there's just nothing like the Southern Ocean anywhere. Imagine a wind, the width of California. Imagine a wind that's as wide as from Los Angeles to San Francisco that is going to blow continuously all the way to the East Coast. Okay, have you ever flown to the East Coast? It's a long way to the East Coast. Have you ever driven across Texas? It's a long way across Texas. So you're talking about a power that is so expansive, it almost is incomprehensible in some ways. Um, now, there's other people who go down there just for the fun of it, uh, if you can call this fun. Uh, this particular guy, Bernard Mautissier, uh, Bernard was a Frenchman. He liked to do things his way. He did things that nobody could understand, but only Bernard could understand them. Right? Uh, he was actually winning one of these solo races going around the world, and he was so far ahead uh, coming around Cape Horn, he was supposed to take a left turn and go back to Europe and win the race. And he said, you know what? I don't think I want to do that. So he just stayed in the roaring 40s and kept going across all the way past Africa, through the Indian Ocean, past Australia, and back to Tahiti. He just decided, I think I'm, I'm, I, civilization does not reward me. I can find what I need here in the ocean. Uh, but the thing about this particular image, and this book is uh, well uh, thumbed by me, and to understand this man's personality was another thing that I was looking to do in writing my novel. But um, this is pretty accurate. Wow. That's pretty much what it's like. Okay. Um, and the waves do get that big. And there's not just one wave, but there's another one, and there's another one, and there's waves from here to North Carolina, okay, one after another. So, Moitissier, and there he is, you know, communing with the grand powers of, of, of nature, as only a Frenchman can. But, you know, you have to really hand it to the guy, because he survived this more than once. Okay, so, let's keep going. Now, this is the basic route. Now, we're going to shift gears to, we're going to go back to the age of sail a little bit. And we're going to talk about just what the Roaring Forties, the Furious Fifties, and the Screaming Sixties did for commerce. Because when England was colonizing Australia, uh, what they would do is they would ship timbers, they would load ships up with timbers and take them all the way down here, and then they would put in in Australia, and they would offload the timber, 
and they would load up with grain, and then they would come back around in this conveyor belt and go back up to England. So this is the, the primary trade route that first pioneered the waters of the uh, Southern Ocean. And here it is, a little bit more complicated, but um, running the easting down, that was the phrase they used when you start here in England and you come down and then you just keep going to the east. And that's what powered these tall ships. That's where these tall ships with these clouds of sails really came into their own. Because you could move ships that weighed three, four, five, six, seven thousand tons that were loaded with two, three, four, five thousand tons of, um, of cargo. And you could move them simply by how much wind and wave there were to get them from, from here all the way around. And then, now of course, now they ran into problems up and down the Atlantic. But they were more than happy to use this natural phenomenal, this natural phenomena, to move these huge cargo ships. And that's what they look like. This is uh, Peking, and that's Parma, and that's what these ships actually look like. The Germans uh, built the most powerful of the sailing ships. Uh, it's called the P Line, and they named all the ships with names that started with the letter P. And these two ships are actually finishing a race that started in China. They started in China. Um, let's see if I can do this without getting too sideways here. Um, they started in China, loaded up with tea, came all the way down here to past Australia, down into the Roaring Forties, and then came all the way around the globe, <coughs> past Cape Horn, and then they came up the Atlantic, and they came right to England. And um, this, they, they actually were racing each other. And they raced each other for almost 12,000 miles. And this is how close they were at the last part of their passage up into the English Channel. But the, 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 the key about this particular image is that these two ships, this is what they look like. Um, once again, you can look at the palm trees over there. Well, the masts were maybe two and a half times the height of those palm trees. Okay. Wow. Oh, and you're shipping out on one of these because you think it's a romantic idea. And then the captain says, aloft with you. <laughs> Up you go. Up you go. We've got to, let's, let's take in the sky sail, right? sails again. Um, people have this romantic image of the golden age of sail. Well, there was nothing romantic about it. These, these ships were incredibly dangerous places to work, as you'll see in just a minute. They were huge ships. They were really big. Now, this is what's called a breakup yard. And most of those ships, there are probably about, excuse me. Um, when, when was this built? When were, were those ships built? They were built in the late 18, 1890 to 1900, and they sailed for about 35 years. And where were they built? They were built in Germany. In Germany, because I didn't know they were great uh, shipbuilders. Um, well, the, the Germans actually were very interested in building these huge ships because they needed nitrate for gunpowder for World War I. And the place where you get nitrate is on the, um, the coast of Chile and Peru. And... Uh, that was a very interesting version of, hey, we need to get this stuff because the, we can't synthesize it yet and we use nitrate, of course, for gunpowder. But yeah, the Germans were incredible seamen and in fact, the DVD we're gonna show uh, is uh, was shot on one of their ships. Okay, um, so here are all these ships and there's uh, Pomeran, there's uh, Parmir, there's Parma, there's three of the German ships and this is 1933 and this is almost at the end of the Age of Sail. And they were still making passages. I think the last tall ship without an engine made a passage in 1949. It was the very last time we sailed. But once again, this is in uh, southern Australia. And all these ships are waiting for cargoes full of grain that they can then take back to Europe. Um, so there you are. And um, that's your job. All right. Uh, anybody take a cold shower today? <laughs> okay. Well, if you really want to understand this, 
go take a cold shower. In fact, it's really windy tonight, so make sure when the wind's really blowing, go, get, go outside and take a hose and just squirt it all over yourself and just do that for eight hours. And that, or actually only four, because it was four on and four off. But this is one of the things that we have to understand about the great age of sail. I mean, this guy's smiling, but, <laughs> but the waves and where he is and how big this ship is and how complicated all this is. And all of this is all in the name of absolute sailing efficiency, and none of it had anything to do with personal safety. Well, maybe some things here and there, but basically these were extremely rough places to work. Uh, so, a lot to go, and uh, once again, uh, you can see how big this ship is. I think this picture was taken uh, on one of the uh, German ships, but um, these ships were huge. They were gigantic. The, the hold, we could put all of this whole room would fit inside the hold of one of these ships. Um, they used to have problems with the atmosphere in the hold uh, becoming moist, and they had to make sure that when they loaded the nitrate or they loaded grain or they loaded any of their other cargo, that the cargo was comparatively dry because if it started getting wet, then you had a weather underneath that would end up uh, creating a smoldering cargo. And that was a very serious situation. Um, there you go. Get to work, <laughs> you and your friends, right? That's. And this particular image, we'll see it again later in the, in the presentation. Wow. But um, here, this is. There's probably more surf on the deck right here than there is over at Oxnard Shores today. You know. So you know, every time you go, go across the street, and wow, these waves are kind of powerful. Well, in the Southern Ocean, the waves are so powerful that they would come up on the deck. And once again, when you want to talk about the deck of one of these ships, um, we're probably, uh, we're about, well, we're pretty much above the waterline here, but not that much more. So you can imagine waves coming up over the window here and getting on to the deck. It's, they're amazing places to consider uh, making a living. But once again, a lot of the sailors, um, this was their life, and it was some, for some of them, it was the only life they ever knew. Okay, now we're up on the spar, and we're bringing in the sails. And in the DVD you're going to see in a few minutes, um, you're going to see just what this was like to be up there. Because the movie, I was very excited to be able to get a copy of this DVD. Um, I hope it's going to work with our mic system. Thanks, Larry. Thanks, everybody, because we don't quite have a sound system coming out of that. But the idea is that... This is very real. This is what these guys did. And sometimes, depending on the weather, you'd have to go up and change sail two, three, four times during your, your four hour watch. You go below for four hours, then you do four hours on again. So it was a life unlike any other. Um, here's a very interesting painting. And once again, we're talking about the first humans to go through the Southern Ocean on a regular basis in the name of commerce, in the name of moving cargo. Nobody was going down there for sport, not until I think the first, um, well, Moitissier, Dumas, um, uh, Robin Knox Johnston, various people did go just to see if they could do it. But the very first people that were constantly in the Southern Ocean, that were constantly dealing with the power of the Southern Ocean, it was all in the name of commerce on the tall ships. Now, this is a, I included this image because this is a very accurate, uh, in many ways, this is a very accurate image of just how big the waves are and just what these ships had to do, especially coming around Cape Horn. Okay, and now these, these ships are going into the wave. This one's going into the wave, so the waves are coming at you. The ship's going that way, and here's another wave. Here's this one, and then there's another one right there. And then there's going to be another one after that, and there's going to be another one after that. It's, uh, a, the surfing term is corduroy to the horizon, <laughs> and that's what they saw in the Southern Ocean. Uh, if you happen to see a passing ship, well, you, maybe you saw them, maybe you didn't. Um, the sailing life was such that if you saw another ship, it was a very unusual occurrence. Um, although it did give you a sense of, wow, there's other human beings somewhere. In fact, the, in the Southern Ocean, the uh, place furthest distant from land is indeed about two-thirds of the way from Australia to South America. Um, I think it's, it's 
right about, uh, let's see if I can find it. It's way down here. It's right, right out here someplace. But once again, you know, like, it's closer than I thought. It's down in here. And so you're a long way from land. Well, actually, you're not that long. You're not that far from land. Uh, a young sailor was getting a little homesick. He was getting a little seasick. They'd been out for about a three-month voyage. And uh, he's talking to uh, an old salt. And uh, he said, well, uh, when do you think we'll make it to port? And the old salt said, well, we'll, we'll we're going to make it when we're there. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, you think it's very far away? And he said, well, I don't know. I'm not doing the navigation. And um, uh, the old salt gets a glint in his eye and says to the young man, but we're not very far from land. And the young sailor says, we're not. We're close to land. And the old salt says, yeah, we're only two miles from land. And the, the youngster says, oh, we're only two miles from land? And the old salt says, yeah, two miles straight down. <laughs> Ah, yes. There you are. Next time you're behind your steering wheel, uh, consider what it would take to uh, uh, actually be steering these tall ships. One of the things they used to do, and um, they don't have an image here, but they would put, on, in really big swells, they would put a sail. They would put a sail up behind the helmsman because they didn't want him looking back. Okay? Didn't want him to see what was right behind him. Okay. <laughs> Uh, there's another story, um, uh, in fact, uh, I urge all of you, when you've got the time, to spend an afternoon here at the museum's library, where I did a lot of research. Um, one of the interesting stories was that um, there was a young man at the helm of one of these tall ships, and he stayed at the helm through two watches, through his watch and the next watch. And he, he, he was supposed to go below, but he couldn't go below because he couldn't leave the, the wheel. And the reason he couldn't leave the wheel was because he was the only guy on deck because the previous watch had gotten completely swept off the deck. And he was the only guy on deck for four hours. And his watch comes back up. And they said, why are you still here? And he said, well, I couldn't abandon my post. And they said, well, where's everybody else? And he said, they're not here. And an entire half of a crew got swept overboard. And this young man had to stay at the wheel because uh, had he left his post, she would have broached, and um, they probably would have gone to a sailor's purgatory, which is actually known as being missing. Now, it was one thing for sailors to run aground, and maybe parts of the ship were found, uh, maybe they were sailors made it to land, maybe the lifeboats worked, you know, so maybe some survivors could tell the tale, but the most a uh, difficult moment in a sailor's life was to consider an end that would result in his being simply listed as missing because nobody would ever know what happened. Uh, in fact, in 1905, in the vicinity of Cape Horn, in between Cape Horn and um, southern tip of South America and southern tip of South Africa, 35 ships were lost and 17 of those ships were listed as missing. Nobody knows whatever happened to them. So I'm not much of a believer in the Bermuda Triangle, but I am a believer in the power of the open ocean to simply swallow ships. In fact, in the Agujas, that actually did happen. The ship came down off of one swell, and here comes the other swell, and the ship didn't come up, and the ship just went underwater, and that was it. So, I mean, in big, once again, this whole building, right? Imagine this, something the size of this building just getting swallowed by the ocean. Okay. So, um, now, we've gone, we started over here in Australia. We followed the West Wind Drift. It's just taking us, and now we're going to Cape Horn. Uh, Cape Horn was named by a Dutchman after his hometown in uh, the Netherlands. His hometown was Horn. Uh, my, I don't think my Dutch is very good. But that's where the name came from. And Cape Horn is actually a little bit of an island right there. There are now cruise ships that go around Cape Horn, but they're not down there right now because right now it's winter time in the Southern Hemisphere. And so the cruise ships, the Lars Eric Lindblad, the National Geographic ships, etc., none of those cruise ships are down there because uh, it's just too radical. 
the weather is just terrible. Yes. We were down there about 10 years ago in 50 foot seas. Well, there you have it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, the fact that they were even having cruises going around there was pretty amazing. So what uh, 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 Magellan realized that trying to go around there, because remember, all these waves are coming like this. There's like there, the storms are just doing this. Okay. So. He figured out that there's got to be another passage, and the Straits of Magellan were the means by which many ships were actually able to make it through um, these archipelagos. But the tall ships couldn't do that. Because remember, these tall ships did not have engines. They didn't have engines. So if something happened, they had these huge masts with all these sails, and they had to move, they had to wear a ship, and you just couldn't do it in the Straits of Magellan because it was too narrow. Now, um, this picture we've already seen before, and um, here are our intrepid mariners up on the spar, and this is the cover of the book, The Cape Horn Breed. And um, this particular book is here in the uh, Channel Islands Maritime Museum Library, and I'd like to read you a little passage from um, Captain Jones, uh, the introduction. The men who were my seniors and shipmates, on the voyage described in this book were sailors of the Cape Horn breed, a species now almost extinct. But the traditions they upheld will long survive in the memory of the seagoing race. Seagoing, I guess that's surfers, so, you know. Um, a way of life happily obsolete, yet it may serve to remind the younger generations of the advantages they enjoy and of the progress that has been achieved within living memory. The techniques of that bygone era may still occasionally be of value to seamen who, in times of emergency, may find themselves thrown upon their own resources by the failure of ingenious mechanical contrivances. For this reason, I have not hesitated to describe sailing ship procedures in detail, many of which call for improvised action. The lore of sailing can never disappear entirely from the traditions of a maritime nation. And that's from the introduction to uh, Captain Jones' book. Um, the other book that was a key part of my research, now I've got 15 surfboards, and so and each one is a prized possession, but I wouldn't trade any of them for this book, and this is uh, Felix Reisenberg's book, Cape Horn. Uh, this book is also here in the library. Um, this is a copy that I've had for over 35 years. And um, in times when I've had to move from one place to another, of course, I've been able to live here in the shores uh, since 1992. But prior to that, I jumped around a little bit. And any time I would go from one place to another, the first thing I would move is my surfboards, and the next thing I would move is my library. And the most prized possession in my library is this book, all about Cape Horn. And we're going to see some pages from this book in just a minute. OK, so Cape Horn. These are the intrepid mariners. These are the guys who actually went through the Southern Ocean on these huge ships. And the, um, uh, I think there's a poem, and this is the poem, and I'm going to let you read it. Uh, Adalbert was a young man, his job was just to go around the boat all the time and daub paint and all the rust. But I think, can everybody read that okay? I'll let you go ahead and read it to yourself. Some of the sailors, when um, you're talking about out of the southwest, which is, once again, the storms are coming from the west and going towards the east, uh, came the end of the world. Um, for many sailors, um, that storm was the end of their world. Okay, um, here it is, a, and this is basically, here it is. This is a, sorry about the reproduction for this, but this is a ship, and that's Cape Horn. And uh, the ship didn't make it, and this is what the crew is enduring. And remember those photos right at the beginning of my presentation, the most mad seas. Not only is your ship foundering, but now you've got to get in these little boats. And, uh, you know, Lord help you. 
Now, this is kind of the culmination of my part of the presentation, and once again, we're going to uh, take a quick break while we set up for the DVD. But I wanted to call attention to this particular uh, um, uh, set of images because it really represents how extreme things are in the Southern Ocean and around Cape Horn. Now, um, here is uh, 50 South in the Atlantic, and here is 50 South in the Pacific, and ships would go around Cape Horn. And the records are going from there, around Cape Horn, there's Cape Horn, that little thing right there, going around there was 23, was nine days. Um, the average passage was 23 days. Well, the Edward Sewell in 1914, to go from 50 south in the Atlantic to 50 south in the Pacific, it took them 67 days. Basically, imagine going from here to San Francisco and back. You go to San Francisco and you come back. You can get there in nine days, 23 days. But imagine that the winds and the waves and the storms are so powerful that you can't make any progress. In fact, you can start here where he's, you can follow this and it then it blew him down here. And then, oh, they're making some progress and they're trying to get north. Well, it blew them south. Now it's blowing them back over this way. And they've got to go back. And now it blew them completely backwards. Blew them back to almost where they started. Now they're going to come down through here. They're going to go up there. They're going to go all the way through this. They're going to go get blown back again. And finally, they're going to come down here. And they're going to make it up in the Pacific. Uh, in fact, here's the log, and this is from the book Cape Horn. And if you ever fancy yourself an armchair adventurer, you want to sit back on a cold, windy night, reading this log word for word will shiver your timbers. <laughs> because this is the story of 67 days of, I don't know, I, I, there's no words for it. I think uh, um, uh, Captain Quick, he basically, here he goes, across 50 south in the Atlantic. Uh, well, they're right under Cape Horn. Very heavy gale. Raining. Uh, everything's going okay. Looking good. Uh-oh. Here comes a gale. Another gale all day long. The ship's under sail. Heavy gale. Heavy gale. Very heavy southwest gale. Oh, it lightened up a little bit. Um, through a bit of terrible sea. Well, that's just from March 7th to March 23rd. Let's keep going, okay? <laughs> heavy gale, heavy gale, strong, heavy cross sea, uh, cross sea, heavy gale, terrible gale, two men hurt, <laughs> terrible cross sea, lost an outer jib, terrible heavy sea, same terrible sea. Now remember, that's the whole month of March. The whole month. You're fighting against winds and waves that are pushing you back pushing you back. Uh, it got a little nice. Uh-oh. Terrible heavy gale. Terrible heavy gale. Heavy gale. But we're not done yet. Let's keep going. Oh, now we're going to go for April for three weeks. 67 days of this stuff. Yes? Wasn't there ice chunks also that it had to navigate around? Or? Um, that didn't figure into this particular account. Um, there was a certain amount of that to deal with, in, uh, uh, but not in this particular case. Uh, so, once again, what we're talking about here is uh, cross sea, strong gale, heavy gale, strong gale, very heavy, um, terrible heavy sea, gale to calm and terrible heavy sea, raining all day. Okay, uh, now they're almost back, we're, now they're back east of Cape Horn. They just went around in a big circle. From March 24th to April 16th, all you did was four hours on, four hours off. It's water's freezing, the wind's howling, the ship's going up and down, the ship's twice as big as this museum, and you're back where you started. Um, keep going, heavy snow squalls. Uh, the mate got hurt. Um, he lost two more fingers. <laughs> Not just two fingers, but he lost two more fingers. Okay, uh, makes three this trip. And this oh. is the captain. Okay, 
Um, the wind was west. Now he has to stand in the mate because the mate is, he's, he's, he gave up. Okay. Um, now, what is that going to look like? It's going to look like that all day, every day, for 67 days. That's what's going on down at the Southern Ocean. And one of the things that's kind of interesting is, this is April, right? This is all happening in the Southern Ocean right now. Okay, it's real. It's still there. Okay, and the next time there's some big waves across the street coming out of the south, and the swells are pushing up Oxnard Shores towards Ventura, those waves come from the Southern Ocean because all that power, all those waves, all that endless expanse of massive energy, it's down there right now. Okay, and then finally, oh, not yet, uh, got a man hurt. Um, there, once again, strong gale, heavy gale, terrible heavy gale. The whole ship's underwater. I mean, he's just the old neighbor. <laughs> I mean, yes, yeah, she's got five inches in her. There's water coming over the deck. Oh, in May, well, we've got some fine weather. Well, that's good. Uh-oh, heavy sea, all right? Wait a minute, here comes another storm, okay? And then finally, oh, the bosun has been in bed for 46 days. I think he's afraid to get out. <laughs> this is the captain's log. This is the way they saw things. This is the way, and it's just an amazing account, as you can see. Uh, finally, we had, um, wait, wait a minute, it's backing off, it's backing off. Oh, good, the first time the ship's decks have been dry for 60 days, right? Okay, and then finally, we, they crossed 50 south in the Pacific, and we made it. So if you ever really want to think about the great age of sail, if you ever really want to think about the power of, uh, of the ocean, if you want to specifically focus on what's one of the heaviest encounters ever, because once again, it's not like surfing big waves where you can get out of the water. It's not like uh, climbing a mountain where you can just go back down. These guys are out there, and they're either going to make it to port or they won't. And so the idea of 67 days... It's one of the all-time feats in the history, in human history, as far as I can tell. Yeah, question. Where was he sailing from, and what was his destination? Uh, he was sailing from um, England, and I believe his destination was in... You know, I don't know the answer to that. I can look it up in the book. I don't know exactly what his port of call was. Yes. Is it so that Captain Bly gave up trying to to double the cape east to west and eventually turned around and sailed east to Tahiti? Uh, that might be so. I'm not familiar with that, but that does sound like a reasonable idea. It's like, how do you get to Tahiti? Well, let's just go around the world the other way. It'll be easier. So, good point. It is true. The weather. Okay, so let me uh, go ahead and give you a couple of minutes just to stretch because now I want to show you a film that was made in 1929 and one of the very last voyages around Cape Horn on a ship that didn't have an engine on one of the tall ships. So let's take a, a, minute, a little break. This film's about 39 minutes long, so I welcome you to stay. But I hope you've gotten a few minutes so far for Cape Horn.